Joining us now here from NBC Sports Boston is our friend Tom Curran. How are you, Tom? A tremendous, Rich. How you doing, buddy? I We had to give you a call. We had to phone you up because um, we have been talking about that quarterback room in New England since the day Brady left, and you kept telling us it's Stidham. It's going to be Stidham. And now mm-hmm. Andy Dalton is a free agent, and I'm wondering if the cash-strap Patriots would figure out a way to bring Andy Dalton to New England. I really don't know if they are anxious to do so. I mean, I was told early on in the process that and when Brady was still a Patriot, that the Patriots were not going to be going that holdover veteran type route mid tier guy. So that's what I've stuck with. I haven't been disabused of that. Um, So I think we saw last week with what they did in the draft that they feel okay about Stidham to me, Andy Dalton is just a souped up Brian Hoyer. It's the same kind of guy. And what are you going to get? See, that's the thing, Rich, is, is trying to figure out what the Patriots are. You know, Mike Florio tried to say, okay, who are the 10 teams that Sean Payton was talking about as in terms of our consequential in the NFL? Because there's 10 every year. And Mike immediately included the Patriots. And I wonder if that's even true. I wonder if the Patriots are a consequential team in 2020. Because when you look at the status of their roster, I don't think they are. They don't have the cap room to bring on Andy Dalton, A. And B, whether you bring on Andy Dalton or not, I don't know if this is going to be a team that goes better than 10 and 6 or 11 and 5 and goes very deep. So find out what you got instead of. Yeah, I guess that's the idea is find out what you have instead of. But Dalton, you know, I know you <laughs> souped up Brian Hoyer. By the way, that's I disagree that's, with that. Uh, I mean that 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 is some uh, because I mean he does have some good numbers in 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 Cincinnati, uh, Tom. He just he just did not he did not perform well under the lights. That's the that's the one right. thing you could say about Dalton. And in New England, they're going to be playing a lot of games under lights, you know, because they're the New England Patriots. They're Belichick. It's post Brady. But, uh, you know, I, again, I, it really is, is what is the evaluation to Stidham? That's really what it is right yeah, now. Maybe I have a higher regard for, for Hoyer than most people do. And, again, he's got a four-pick playoff game where he submarined his team before it was out of the first quarter once. So that's what people are stuck with, too. I don't think Hoyer's that bad. I don't think, certainly don't think that Andy Dalton is an offensive option. I don't. I, so I don't want to make it sound that way, but what are you as the New England Patriots? What are you trying to achieve this year? Because championship-driven is nice and everything. But I don't think that they can seriously look in the mirror and say that we're championship-driven this year. They have to build in a lot of different spots. So I, I just think it's prolonging the inevitable if you bring in Andy Dalton to take over that spot. Because he's not going to sit there and watch Jarrett Stidham all year. He's coming in to start. So yeah. what, 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 is, what, what will New England's philosophy for 2020 be tom what's their prognosis what's their philosophy you know because oh, your philosophy you're... has to be to to tear the band-aid off financially mm-hmm. they're taking the bite with the 13 million dollars for brady it's another four million dollars kicking around from antonio brown there's about 20 million dollars in dead cap money maybe more that's hitting their cap so tear the band-aid off there in the draft you know they move back but what they got was a, a second round pick who's probably a year away at a position that's older but good. So Kyle Duggar comes in, and he learns how to play from Chung and McCourty. So he's not even a guy who's going to walk in and contribute. The Patriots are sending every signal they can that they're rebuilding, and they acknowledge that. They did it in the second round with, you know, two tight ends who are complementary but, you know, project guys. They sent it in free agency. They didn't go out spending. You know, I I just think that, you know, that is their philosophy this year. We're going to be smarter. We're going to be tougher. We're going to reinstill a culture. We're going to be a post-Brady team that figures out who it is and what it wants to be. But I, I just think it's it's fascinating to watch, and that's why we keep talking about it. But it's it's not what people think. It's not going to be a continuation of what we just saw for the last decade, nor for the last two decades. Is this a... Uh... I, I, and heaven forbid for me to even suppose it, but I would suppose it if it was another team. I would absolutely suppose it if it was another team, but not one that obviously Bill Belichick uh, would be um, in charge of coaching, but 
you have to ask the question, is this a tank for Trevor situation that we're watching in progress, Tom, Karen? No. They're not taking for Trevor because they're never going to be bad enough to get into the top 10. I mean, at worst, they're going to be 6-10 and 10 just because they're too well coached. I really don't think that they're tanking. I think they're trying to figure out who they are. This reminds me completely of the 2000 season when Belichick came in and the team was in financial disarray and you had to fumigate and clean out a lot of the roster. Now, they don't have to reboot the culture and they don't have to cut as many guys, but they are, they are in the worst financial straits they've been in in two decades. There's, and that's the interesting thing. Look how much better life would have been if Brian Suarez just tanked. Instead of a guy with a bad hip that you don't know how good he's going to be, you'd have Joe Burrow. But culturally, that was too far to, a bridge too far for them to cross. And I think that that would be what the Patriots would feel as well. We're not going to we're not going to do that. I'm not going to do that to Patrick Chung and Devin McCourty and Dante Hightower and tell them you know what, we're going to suck this year, so go out and put yourself at risk every Sunday. It's just, you you know it, too. You're just asking it, but... No, it's I, just I do know it, too, and I, I but that's, I had to, I had to ask the question, because if it was Miami, if it was, uh, you know, um, the Jets, or even a team that's near and dear to my heart, you know, uh, name, name another team, I would have, I would have essentially asked that question, because how in the world are you going to follow up one of the most successful tenures any team has had in any sport. How are you going to follow that up when you know one of the main, the half of the main characters of that dynasty has left and is set up to win a Super Bowl and is set up to succeed and took one of your main pieces in Gronk? Mm -hmm. That how are you going to go into that season and say, you know what, if we go six and 10, we're going to look for the long haul. Understand, obviously, Belichick is playing a long game here because he has no intention of of retiring to that great kitchen setup that he has. Um, so that's the reason why I asked the question. Yeah, it's, it's fair. But again, when we look at quarterbacks in general, what the Patriots have done at the position over the years and still won has been remarkable. A sixth-round pick a seventh round pick in Matt Castle who didn't play in college, still got him 11 wins. Brian Hoyer has been kicking around the NFL for 11 years now. He was undrafted. Jimmy Garoppolo from division two, they were able to, to craft him into a guy who's got a hundred million dollar contract. Um, Jacoby Brissett became a starter in, in Indianapolis. They're going to have great confidence that they can develop a guy without having to tank for the player that, people say is going to be so great, who then in five years is going to pose incredible um, financial issues if the team does succeed. I just think that I, I don't know this for a fact, mm -hmm. but when you look at what they did with Brady and their confidence that they could do very – look, if Andy Dalton was their quarterback since 2010, I swear to you, and Brady wasn't here, and Andy Dalton was their quarterback from 2010 to 2020 – if you hit Belichick with the truth serum, serum and said, would you have won a Super Bowl? I bet he'd say, yeah. Yeah, we would have won a Super Bowl. Mm. Tom I mean, that's how confident. Right. Tom Curran of NBC Sports Boston here uh, on the Rich Eisen Show and your latest column at NBCSports.com. If it's up to fans, Bill Parcells is never getting into Patriots Hall of Fame. We were kind of discussing it here, and uh, the New York, New Jersey guy next to my New England guy is like, of course he's getting in the Hall of Fame. And the New England guys go, oh, hold on a minute, you know. So I give you the floor on what this is all about, what's being played out right now in Patriots land. Yeah, it's fascinating. Patriots started the Hall of Fame in 2007. They said one guy in at a time. Well, they didn't know what was going to happen for the next 13 years was going to create such a line at the front door. They also made it fan vote. We as a selection committee put up three candidates. And every year we put up the three candidates and then the fans vote on them. And every time Parcells has been one of the three candidates up for a vote, he finishes a distant third. So you got a 79-year-old who helped rebuild this franchise and legitimize it and took it to a Super Bowl and made it so much more compelling than it was, who, unless he is somehow ushered into the hall through the back door, is probably not going to get in before he passes away. That's the truth. It's Welker, it's Mankins, it's Vrabel, it's Seymour, it's Wilfork, it's Gronkowski, it's Brady, it's Belichick. It's You cannot put ourselves on with any of those people and expect him to get in so 
to me, I think they have to backdoor the situation because it's Patriots fans don't forget what happened in 96, and they don't forget that from 97 to 2000, he actively, you know, tried to undercut the Patriots at every turn. Well, so walk, fascinating. walk through what, what he did in 96 for people who don't know or remember. Oh, sure. Uh, in 96, Terry Glenn was on the draft board. The Patriots wanted to follow the draft board. Bobby Greer and um, Robert Kraft and Parcells did not want Terry Glenn, so he was overruled. They took Glenn, and that sealed Parcells and Kraft's relationship in that timetable. And as a result, at the end of that season, when the Patriots made it to the Super Bowl because the Jacksonville Jaguars knocked off the Denver Broncos and the Patriots didn't have to play the Broncos, Patriots end up in the Super Bowl and Parcells was already signed, sealed, delivered to New- to the Jets. And he spent the- a portion of the week on the phone trying to figure out a way to get himself to New York. Well, he didn't fly home with the Patriots after they lost that Super Bowl. And soon thereafter, he got himself to the Jets. And after he got to the Jets, he signed Curtis Martin to a poison pill contract the next year. And he did everything he could to wrangle and rankle the Patriots for the next three years. And then when Bill Belichick was set to quit and come to New England, Parcells tried to block him. So Patriots fans remember well all that stuff. And that's why when you put it in their hands, they go, no, he was a traitor. Well, yeah. So I guess that, <laughs> by, by that respect, uh, I don't know, do the Jets fans have a vote on whether Belichick gets into the Jets Hall of Fame? You know? Because I mean, look, I mean, when you when you when you when you put it all into it, I mean, Belichick would. Let's put it this way: Would Belichick be the current coach of the Patriots if Parcells never walked through the door? Great question. Mm. Um, I don't know. Would they have crossed paths someplace else, or would I it be Don Capers? I don't. You know what I mean? Like seriously. Again, I mean, would the Patriots Belichick be went, in New England if Parcells hadn't walked through the door? That's a good. They could be in Hartford, Connecticut. I remember that. I remember that when I was on. They were, my, I, oh yeah, they were yeah. talking about it seriously, Tom. Right, and that was even after they were successful. That's when Pete Carroll was here. They 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 weren't just talking about it. He sat down and signed a contract to go to Hartford. Kraft did with the with the governor John Rowland. I'll send you the picture. No, he I, looks like he's going to be sick to his stomach. Hey man, I was on Sports Center at the time, and we were all sitting there saying, "Are we going to have an NFL team in our backyard? Are we literally going to be able to sit here in <laughs> Bristol?" I'm serious. We're going to be sitting here on Sports Center in Bristol, Connecticut, and take a ten less than ten minute drive, depending on traffic, um, and, and be in an NFL facility. Are we really going to do that? And that's a, and and I was walking around. And that was just a few weeks after I was so stunned that an, NF, an NHL team played in the mall in Hartford. You know, I went to see Yager right. and, and Lemieux. By the way, I think I, both about a hat trick one night against the poor Hartford Whale, you know, uh, in the mall. And I remember sitting there thinking, are we really going to get the Patriots here in Hartford? And obviously that didn't happen. But, you know, Kraft is uh, who he is and where he is in the pantheon of the NFL for, uh, you know, in his own right. But it, it did start with Kraft turning to Bill, right, and changing everything around. And Parcells is the one who brought Belichick to New England. And then he brought Belichick with him to the Jets. And then when the Jets and Parcells, you know, uh, fell apart with Leon Hess, the owner of the Jets. I mean, let's go. Let's do the whole lineage here. Leon Hess, the owner of the Jets, uh, sold the team to Woody Johnson, and and I guess Belichick read the writing on the wall, and he's like, "I'm I'm going to New England," and he he resigned right. on a cocktail napkin, and that was the end of that. Would any of that happen yeah, if Parcells had never walked through the door in New England? Any of it? Yeah, I mean, one detail on that too was Parcells was actually hired by James Bush Art Worthwine. Kraft bought the team after Parcells was named head coach. So it wasn't Kraft's pick. So that was kind of a Leon Hess, Woody Johnson situation for Parcells right. a little bit that he didn't escape from. So, but here's the thing: Parcells being who he is, and Kraft being who he is, right. both of the men being 79 years old, they should have a day here, and they should find a way to get it done because they're closer to the end than the beginning. Quite suddenly, as we all are. <laughs> So, I guess that's the ultimate question, um, and then and then we could you know uh, spend a couple minutes on on one other subject. But it does imagine it does. I guess all comes down to what what RKK thinks of all this. What does Robert Kraft think? 
I think he likes the opportunity to show that hatchets are buried, and we'll see if he comes up with a way to do it. Um, Stacy, who you know, Stacy James, has yep. poured a lot of effort and sweat into that Hall of Fame and crafting it in a certain way. And every year he busts his ass to make sure that we do a good job to, to put it together. Yep. So it kind of would suck if we figure out a different way to get a guy into the club <laughs> that is outside the realm. Sure. Um, I think Stacy would say, what are we doing? We, we can't do this, but we'll see what happens. Tom Curran of NBC Sports Boston here uh, on the Rich Eisen Show. What's the Gronk fallout? Any? Nothing specific. I think that people here in New England, as they often do, once he ended up in Tampa, were quick to say, you know what, screw him anyway. Um, because he really did author an exit that was Belichickian in some ways, uh, Belichickian, because, you know, he he timed it up so that they were right up against the cap and said, hey, I'm coming back. You can either trade me to this one team or um, – I'll come back to your team, you know. So it was the, he really backed them into a corner, unretiring. So no team was going to trade for him, knowing that he wouldn't report to them. The Patriots couldn't cut him mm -hmm. because then he would have gotten what he wanted, and they would have gotten no compensation. And they couldn't have called his bluff and you know had him rostered because then they would have been over the cap. So it was a, a fairly shrewd move. We'll see. Honestly, how Belichick views that in the future. What what will his relationship be like with Gronkowski? Because of all the guys who didn't have a say in where they landed, Vrabel, Seymour, Mankins, on and on and on, Malloy, um, Gronkowski ends up being the guy who orchestrates a departure on his terms and gets what he wants. It's, it's kind of funny. So... Um... How much of it's Gronk and how much is it his agent saying, well, let me handle this? Is Gronk really playing three-dimensional chess? <laughs> um, somebody might have tapped him on the shoulder and said, hey, if you do this, it'll work. He's still, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't. He's a Rosenhouse you know. guy still, right, Gronk? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. So because, maybe he did, but Drew's got such a good relationship with Belichick and would never want to damage that. I think that uh well I mean he would have to call Bill up and and smooth that over because I mean if this is you know the way that you have um you've put it out there it sure seems like um or you could sit here and say that Belichick kind of made the first move to try and send him to Detroit to, to Patricia right 100 percent 100 percent but you could also say hey it wasn't me it was Gordy Gronkowski the guy's got five kids who played in the NFL right he knows the landscape he figured it out on his own what am I supposed to do uh, hey he's only doing what he hey, hey look this is a business man when it all comes down to it 100%. you know it you know it I know it it's all about a business and we love talking about loyalty for a reason we love talking about loyalty because we're so loyal to our teams and our cities and what the team is and that's the Jerry Seinfeld phrase that we don't root for the players we root for the laundry you know we root for, for the uniform, um, but obviously we root for players. Certainly when we fall in love with them, people like Gronk are so lovable. Um, but it, when it comes down to it, uh, you just n mentioned all the history of some of these great people who you say will get the red jacket to get in the Patriots Hall of Fame before Parcells, and for good reason, uh, who they are and what they've done to the team. Many of them wound up somewhere else and a couple years before their end of their so-called usefulness, and it's – you know, that's just the nature of the business. It's the nature of the beast. We're they're, seeing it right now in Green Bay all, a little bit, you know, in a way, right? A hundred percent. And they're all they're all self employed contractors. They're all their own little industries, really. And not only that, but they're fighting for a finite piece of pie in a salary cap. So they're actually pitted against each other. Yet they're still able to live within that greenhouse or you know protected element where they're all with each other and, and pulling in the same direction. It's it's fascinating because they are. They're fighting over the same money. And who's going to get more of it? So professional sports in a salary cap era is really – it shouldn't work, but it does. Last one for you, Tom. Again, I know I keep knocking on this door, and you're saying that it's still – the answer is it's Jared Stidham. Cam, if Cam – we saw what, what uh, Jameis Winston, who I have at the top of my third hour today, is signed for in, in, New, in, uh, in New Orleans. Cam, there's no, there's no shot. 
I mean, why wouldn't New England want to take a, sh a chance on somebody that does have six, seven, eight years of usefulness, that does sell jerseys, that do does put fannies in the seats, and I know that's not Belichick's ultimate concern, but does have an immense amount of ability, a chip on the shoulder. He's just 30. There's no shot of this guy w winding up in New England. I just don't think he takes care of of the football well enough. If you look at his, his interception ratio, if you look at his arm strength, if you honestly look at his accuracy, he's only had one year in which he was over 60. I think he was at 67% in that one year, and that was two years ago. But he just isn't really the quarterback that the Patriots have usually embraced. Now, maybe they change the way they do things, but you know, I was told pretty – I said, look, am I safe continuing to say that there's no shot with, Jared, with uh, Cam Newton coming in? And I was told I was safe with that. Tom, appreciate the time. NBC Sports Boston, Bye, Tom Curran. I'll, I'll, we'll be checking in with you periodically, man. I really appreciate the time. No trouble. Have a great weekend. Right Take back care. at you. That's Tom Curran. Good, Tommy. Calling in from New England. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.